Welcome to this special edition of The Empire's Edge. Instead of having a session of the adventures in the Brimroar Hills, really because our schedules around the holidays have been so crazy that coordinating all of our schedules to have another recording session was just too difficult to do. So we thought we'd take this opportunity to reveal a little more of the backstory behind one of the characters from those very unusual episodes, the episode 33 and episode 34, The Enemy Eyes. Victor had a character named Edgar Keel, who was a lot of fun. People were twittering, tweeting rather, tweeting to us about, <laughs> and uh, thought that he made just a marvelous, terrifying bad guy. And we thought we would put some backstories together. I'd write some backstories. And this story, like others that I've written, can be found on my website, that's mattsinkovich.com, and you'll find stories that are both background stories for the characters on The Empire's Edge of Brimroar Hills. I'll be adding more to it, as well as characters from my novel, An Evil Before, which I'm working on and hoping to publish. So it's a lot of fun for me, and then when all of you have read An Evil Before, once that's published, uh, you'll see the connection and go, oh, wow, those guys actually knew each other. And this was one of those moments that was pivotal in their life and their development. So without further ado, the short story, The Fire and Your Steel. The rise and fall of violin music drifted from the muse to your concert hall, adding itself to the nighttime tapestry of voices and carriages, footfalls and wind in the city of Andern. In an alley with three exits, the clickety tap of gambling dice and the muffled protests of a dying fire betrayed the purpose of the eight young men crouched there. Neither warm nor cold on the edge of the fire's sphere, Sykes Chanson gave up searching its coals for some lost wisdom and, unable to make separate sense of the sounds beyond the alley, idly tried to balance a pine cone on his head. Next to him, Edgar Keel watched the dice of their hazard game the way the abbots of Arngul watched the Hill of the Visitation for a sign of Lasden's return, yet smacked the pine cone from his partner's head with a deft backhand. The other men, hunched over the dice game, didn't notice. You didn't have to do that, Sykes said. Edgar blinked. Pay attention to the work, tip-top. A heartbeat later, Sykes said, There's no art to this, Edgar dismissing the gamblers with a finger. Edgar Keel's entire body seemed to nod at once. No art, he said. We'll set up a game of cards next, ruby chain or pokek, Sykes said. No art, no art. Edgar gestured to the crouching men with his thumb. Beyond keeping these jokers close for jobs, he lowered his voice. We've got them working for us as we're pinching half the coin they've made on their own. We win three tosses out of five. How many times have you come from a table of ruby chain with a loss? Edgar subtly shook his head. No art. It numbs my head, Edgar. It's predictable gain and keeps a crew handy. Sykes frowned and put his back to the diminutive fire, inhaling the soot and stone smell of the alley. He watched the shooter through bands of shadow and light in the confined space. Coins exchanged hands among the side betters, and Edgar took the two silvers from the cobblestone designated for the pass line bet. He rubbed them together, watching Sykes. Sykes had to agree with his eyebrows. The shooter relinquished the dice, and a new man took them. His black, brushed wool clothing made Sykes cross his arms over his chest to hide holes in his coat and looked around to see if more of the city gentry had found their game. The newcomer bent low to set a stack of five silvers on the pass line cobble, but took the casting position standing. The other men exchanged glances. A few put a silver down for side bets. Edgar straightened up. What's your friend up to? Sykes whispered into Edgar's ear. Edgar met his eyes. My friend? I've seen you talk to him before. Edgar eyed the rich-looking shooter, then Sykes. Wrong guy, tip-top. The man rattled the dice and tossed them to the base of the wall. The typical hush rendered all the men equals until they bounced up a three and a four. Natural, a bunch of them cursed. The shooter drew his coat open at the hips and eyed Edgar. The chatter of men stilled as Edgar moved forward and placed five silvers on the cobble, snapping each one on the stone. 
his eyes fixed on the shooter. The man smiled. <laughs> you counted out all five, he said. So educated, despite being so young. Sykes' eyes darked to Edgar. The shooter, Edgar, the shooter. Edgar smiled. All five. <laughs> it's a fortune, the man spread his arms. I'm rich. Edgar nodded. Then you're done shooting. He spoke in warm, round tones and smiled. But the shooter stroked his beard, his gold bracelet showing. No, he said. I didn't crap out. I'll keep shooting. Edgar held his smile with his eyes and mouth. Wonderful. But remember your winnings. Edgar stepped back. The shooter bent low, but instead of retrieving his winnings, he neatly stacked them with the original five. Bet's ten. Sykes' hand went to his dagger. The betters murmured, then held their collective breath. But Edgar, his elbows close to his side, made a small gesture of openness with his hands. Of course. The shooter's broad grin encompassed Edgar and the betters. Too much for you? I don't want to ruin your night. Not too much. The shooter addressed the crouching men, enticing them for side bets. But Sykes brought his mouth close to Edgar's ear. What do you mean, not too much? If he shoots another natural, or beats his point, we're broke. Yes, then he'll do it again, Edgar smiled. Are you crazy? Sykes purposefully smoothed an eyebrow with his middle finger, but kept his voice down. That man won't let it go. He won't give us a day or three to pay him. He'll have fun breaking us and then regaling his lordly friends about how we're still in debtor's prison 20 years after he's forgotten his last butler's name. Calm yourself. Trust. Trust. If he even makes it that far, Edgar went on, he'll lose by the third shot. Then we'll have him and clean up. Clean up, Edgar. He won't notice he's lost. It won't occur to him to stop. Exactly. He won't care. He'll laugh it off and brag that he touched the dirty side of the city. We provided a service for him, but shut up, he's ready. Sykes smoothed his eyebrow again and pressed his lips tight together. The shooters, laughing with the better, placed coins and side bets before taking his place. The dice rattled down to the cobbles as the alley held its breath. Everything stilled. Natural, men shouted. Sykes eyed Edgar. Edgar nodded and rose to the balls of his feet. The between-shooting chatter filled the alley and spilled into the streets. The shooter, arms akimbo, broad grinned, turned, the centerpiece of the game, reveling in the circle of men. People from the street entered the alley. Finally, the shooter picked his side bets from the ground and turned to Edgar and the pass line bet. The talk dropped to quiet. Curious newcomers waited smiles on their faces, looking for a read on the situation. Edgar placed ten silvers on the cobble. The shooter waited until Edgar could meet his eyes. Too much, he asked. Not too much. I'm thinking about letting it ride, he said. Let it ride. Why not, Edgar asked. It's only five of mine, the shooter said. Fifteen of it was yours. Nature of the game. The shooter nodded, his broad smile stretching in the shadows of the waning fire. Sykes eyed the ways out of the alley. More people pressed in. Side bets started. Newcomers joined in. The shooter moved among them, hosting a party. Run, Sykes said to Edgar's ear. No, it wasn't a question. We should run. You heard him. That's 15 of our money. He's not going to quit, Edgar. No problem, Edgar smiled. I'll just kill him. He stepped to the shooter. Ready? A dozen well-dressed newcomers gathered, laughing at the alley, talking about things from beyond its confines. The shooter took his place and rattled the dice in his hand. The crowd failed to quiet, but the shooter's smile, more hidden in shadow, swept and drew them with him. Sykes shot quick eyes to Edgar and the street, but Edgar only clasped his hands behind his back. The shooter's smile settled on Edgar, and the dice rattled to the cobblestones. The city leaned in. 
the clickety tap lasted twice as long as the crowd found its silence and the alley forgot to breathe. Every voice burst as one. Natural! Sykes' eyes rolled from dice to cobble to face to exit, each blending into the next. His dagger came easily to his hand as voices and violins assaulted his ears. He took a step near to Edgar. In a moment, a new, shouting creature inhabited the alley, controlling its raucous energy behind a veil of anticipation. It watched Edgar, and the shooter was its eyes. Nothing moved. The side bet sat where they lay. No one claimed those winnings. The four stacks of five silvers waited like beacons on a canyon floor, a tiny, distant city of inestimable value. Too much? The shooter's grin spread like a smear in the near darkness. We've said those words too much so many times that that's how I've come to think of you. Too much. You're too much. In over your head, unaware of the world, he gestured to the alley playing by your tiny kingdom's rules. He looked to the men, standing above the crouched animals, his tone an exaggeration of himself. Uh, too much? Prepare me some tea. Uh, too much? More wood for the fire. Too much? He paused. Fetch my winnings. The creature crouched for a spring. Edgar's hand moved to his dagger, but relaxed and remained at his side. You cheat very well, he said. The shooter laughed and the rest followed him. When they quieted, he said, You are too much. So well that, Edgar began, but the shooter cut him off. One of you, he grabbed a gambler, Jack, by the shirt and stood him up. Go to the Plaza Square, to the magistrate's house. Tell him Sir Alistair Gannon Gage requires his services. He pressed a coin into the man's hand. A gold, Jack said. Consider yourself elevated. Go. Lead him here. The man ran from the alley. Sykes' head swiveled. The choked alley cut off his breath. He brought up the dagger, a single steel finger selecting each man around him in turn, but the monster didn't back down. Sir Alistair Ganning Gage remained focused on Edgar, but inclined his right temple towards Sykes. <laughs> he dies. But you, too much, you, I'll have brought before the next assizes. And when you admit your poverty before the court, I'll require it force restitution from you in the form of a finger or a toe for each of the 20 silvers left unpaid. He paused considering. In a year or two, we'll undoubtedly meet on the street. I'll recognize you, of course, but our social circles will prevent our reminiscing. <laughs> you certainly will look silly trying to scratch your ass with your elbow. Edgar surged forward, driving his knee into Sir Alistair's groin and simultaneously head-butting him. The nobleman backpedaled into a crouch but stayed on his feet, his bloodied mouth bearing clenched teeth. Sykes lunged all around with his dagger, stamping his foot each time, the shock of the sound slapping like waves on the alley walls. Men scattered. Sykes saw the gamblers, eyes, talker, lover, chow, and hunch, flee the alley in different directions. A boot hit the stacks of silvers and lofted them into the confusion. Alistair snarled and threw himself at Edgar, but even as he did, Edgar hooked his fingers and drew an esoteric circle with his outstretched palm. Fire erupted from his hand as Alistair reached him. The man screamed, his face, neck, and shoulders bathed in a flash of flame. He dropped hard on the cobblestones, trailing misty breath and smoke. The last of the men tumbled from the alley. Only Sykes remained with his dagger still outstretched, and Edgar, whose smooth face and distant eyes betrayed nothing, and Sir Alistair Ganning Gage, unconscious on the cobblestones. Nothing moved. Sykes, his breath calming, saw a silver and picked it up, then another. Come on, Edgar, he said. Find some silvers and let's get out of here. But Edgar took two slow strides to Alistair and knelt by him. He examined the burns on the man's face, then carefully gathered his coat lapels in his left hand. Breathing deeply, he raised his right fist and brought it smashing into the nobleman's face. Edgar hit him again and again. Edgar! Edgar hit the unconscious man again. Sykes ran to him. Edgar, stop! 
With the burns and blood, it appeared as though the corner of Alisher's mouth had torn into his cheek. Edgar lowered his arm and nestled both hands on Alistair's neck. Sykes crouched next to him. Let's go! Edgar squeezed. Sykes' eyes widened as the unconscious man made muffled, wet, sucking sounds. Sykes grabbed Edgar's wrists as running boots could be heard out in the city. Let him go, Edgar, let him go! No, thank you, Edgar said, and continued to squeeze. The boots came closer. Sykes slapped and backhanded Edgar across the face and dragged him upright. They stumbled arm over shoulder out of the alley until Edgar got his feet. Split up, Edgar said. Meet tomorrow with the trial in Tankard. Sykes nodded and sprinted to the wrought iron fence surrounding the courtyard of the Church of Uko. He leapt to the decorative iron pine cone topping the fence and vaulted into the yard, disappearing among gravestones. Edgar ran with increased speed, melting into Andern's shadows his footfalls pounding a heartbeat staccato in the darkness until the shadows swallowed those two. A day later, Syke sat at his favorite table in the trowel and tankard, near the back door, with a view of the front and the street through the window. He sipped a flat beer and saw Edgar approaching the building. His heart raced, but no one paid attention to Edgar as he crossed the floor and sat. What have you heard? Sykes asked. Edgar leaned close across the table. Jack's dead. What? Our Jack? Jackass? What happened? No one seems to know. But he left the alley before everything went sideways, Sykes said, his eyes widening. Yeah, Edgar said, sent away by his royal arse. What does it mean? Alistair Gannon Gage must have had him killed. Why? Think about it, tip-top. Sir Alistair must have come too soon after we left. Edgar, I had to stop you. You were going to kill him. Why wouldn't I? Anyway, Jackass brought the magistrate and his guard right to the alley and into Gage's hands. Ugo's teeth, Sykes said, looking past Edgar at the window. Edgar sipped Sykes' beer. So, Gage had him killed. Wait, Sykes said. He wouldn't have killed him right away. His eyes widened again. Gage would have tortured him. He knows our names. Yes and no, Edgar said. Think about it. Even we don't know the guy's actual names. We called him Jackass, but did you know his real name? Sykes subtly shook his head. His eyes looked far away. Furthermore, Edgar went on, our connections lead to that alley. Beyond that, we don't have connections. Unless he's conscripted a wizard or, or shaman, Sykes said. There is that. What now? Sykes asked. We'll lay low. Avoid places we frequent. Like this. And meet? Sykes asked. In two days. But where? Tip top. Sykes looked out the window for a few seconds. Cran Park. Fair enough, Edgar said. Let's get out of here. He started toward the front door when Sykes caught his arm. Let's go this way. Sykes led them through the back door into an alley. He paused at each corner, leading to the street. He saw a body face down in a pile of garbage. The two men froze. When nothing moved, Sykes motioned for Edgar to close along the wall while he slid up the opposite side. Sykes crouched by the body without touching it. Edgar remained at the closed door, watching both ways. Who is it, Tip Top? Edgar asked. I don't know. Let's get out of here. It has nothing to do with us. No, Edgar said. Roll him over. It could be important. Sykes shook his head, but complied, rotating the body, but quickly let him fall back. What's wrong? Who is it? Edgar asked. It's Hunch. What? How? Sykes looked up and down the alley before lifting the man's coat, feeling around. Single wound, he finally said, through the middle ribs on the left side. Edgar shook his head. That's not a guard's wound, Tip Top. No, Sykes said. It's too precise. He held up a coin pouch. Edgar kept shaking his head. This wasn't a thug or a cut purse, Edgar. It was a proper assassin. Sir Alistair? Edgar asked. Who else? Sykes said. But how could he set up a contract that fast? And how could someone find us so fast? 
It hasn't been, what, 10 hours since the alley. I don't know. Wait, jackass, Edgar said. So Alistair could know more about where we frequent, Sykes said. Yeah, and you were right tip top. He wouldn't let it go. Sykes backed away from the body and put the coin purse down his shirt. We need a new plan, Edgar. If I were this assassin, I'd be watching the end of the alley that leads to the busier street. He'd expect us to try to blend in. We should go the other way, even out the front door of the trial and tankard, like you were about to. Wait. Edgar started shaking his head again. That assumes the assassins knew we'd be here. He crouched low on the wall as he spoke. How could he know that? Maybe there are more than one of them. Edgar looked at the roof lines above them. Now what? Beyond getting out of here. We go after Sir Alistair Gannon Gage. You're insane, Tip Top. Your turn to think about it, Edgar. Alistair's assassins have unlimited time and resources. But if we cut their lifeline, they can't collect expenses or their fee if the coin dries up. Edgar wrinkled his brow, looking at Sykes. But Sykes went on. They'll get us. Edgar, eventually, they'll get us, unless we remove their advantage. Are you suggesting we murder Sir Alistair? I don't know. Sykes leaned hard against the wall, his eyes on Hunch's body. We could leave Tip Top, right out of the duchy, head into Southland. Aren't you from Bolin Barony? Or hide out in the Vistari Waste, or go straight through to the Corman Empire? That's a good idea. Sykes raised up against the wall. That's a good idea. What are you thinking? Edgar asked. We don't need to kill Alistair, only cripple him. Won't work. If he can still give orders, not that kind of crippling. Sykes looked at Edgar. We'll burn his house down. He'll need to focus his financial resources there, recovering. He won't be able to pay assassins. He raised his eyebrow. They might even turn on him at his change of fortune. Then we'll leave like you said. We'll take coin, gems, whatever from his house to give us a start, make travel easier and getting farther away a lot faster. This all makes sense to me, Edgar said, nodding. But we're still in the same place. What do we do right now? Sykes' eyes searched for something not in the alley. Finally, he said, you go out through the front door, make your own way. I'll go out the other end of the alley. Hit up your sources. I'll do the same. We'll find out where Alistair lives. We'll meet up in Cran Park, like I said. We'll plan what's next then. Edgar nodded with his head and shoulders. What about the others? What others? Sykes asked. Eyes, talker, chow, lover. Nothing. Don't go near them. Even though they're capable, any contact with them puts us in danger. Edgar agreed, pursing his mouth. Edgar, Jackass and Hunch were the weakest. Is it coincidental that they got to them first? You mean, did they make mistakes? Edgar asked. Maybe. But maybe they know a lot more about us than we could guess. Maybe Alistair had eyes on us for a long time for some reason. Edgar chewed his lip. I don't know, Tip Top. Yeah, probably not. It does sound crazy if they're taking us out using a list in my head. The young men moved at the same time, Edgar passing into the trial and tankard while Sykes became part of the city outside of the alley. Two days later, Edgar waited in Cran Park, sitting in the lee of a yew tree where a branch arched to the ground. The natural shelter deflected the wind and afforded him a view of the path and gate, though it held a hint of something rotten. Passers-by never looked over. Sykes approached the park gate, dressed as a merchant. Tip-top, tip-top, he thought. Though his peers' eyes washed over everything, they avoided the area of the yew tree. Yet, Sykes scratched behind his right ear with his left hand, the sign he'd spotted Edgar, but walked away down a path. Ten minutes later, Edgar wondered if the man had figured something and fled. It's getting worse, Sykes said from the other side of the tree. Edgar clenched his teeth before, measuring his voice and calming his breath. I could kill you for sneaking up on me that way. Sorry, I thought you knew I was here. Edgar closed his eyes and focused. How is it worse? 
Chow and Lover are dead. Edgar didn't hesitate asking, how'd they die? At different times, but at the same place. Explain that, Edgar said. It looks like the killer surprised Chow in the loft he thought we didn't know about, Sykes said. I spotted a goose feather stuck to the sill. Huh, was all Edgar managed. Yeah, Sykes went on. I went up, figuring it was a trap. And, Edgar asked, and Lover must have too, a couple of hours before me. He was dead in a pool of his own congealing blood. The wound? Poignard. It entered to the right of his spine, between the fourth and fifth ribs, and exited just to the left of his breastbone. Through the heart. Yes, through the heart. Chow was near the window, where the feather was stuck with wax. His fingers had hardened wax on them, Edgar. That's strange. Yeah, he was putting up the danger signal as he was being stabbed. Same wound? Sykes nodded his head. Same wound. Chow must have known they were after him, and he put the signal up, not knowing one of them was in the room with him? How could that be, Edgar? So, what then? Edgar asked. Then the killer waited for one of us to show up, and that's what makes this even more bizarre. Lover would have had to walk right past him to get stabbed in the back. How could that happen? Chow should have smelled someone in the room, and Lover always knows who's around him. Nothing could be done about them now. And why were you there at all? It's not a place I frequent. I thought about breaking in and using it myself, Sykes said. They sat in silence for a minute, two sides of the same tree, until Edgar said, Any luck? None, Sykes said. I couldn't press my sources without giving myself away. You? I got it. You got it? You know where Alistair lives? Why didn't you say that? Never mind. How did you get a street address without giving yourself away? Never mind. He owns a house at the corner of Keaton and Kent Streets, Edgar said. So we get in there, Sykes said. Toss it for anything pocketable, then burn it down. Sounds like a plan. What about security? Sykes dipped his chin, then shook his head. He's not thinking defense. It will be minimal, easy for us to get around. And if we encounter him in the house... Edgar asked. The same as his guards. We'll have the drop on him so we can stay out of sight. Let him walk by and we follow the plan. Follow the plan, Edgar said. All right then. What's the next step, Dip Top? Rendezvous at Keaton and Kent tonight. Tonight? That's not a lot of time to get ready. What's to get ready, Sykes asked. No, you're right, Tip Top. Hit him quick and hard while his net is cast wide and deep in the city, Edgar said, only slightly aware of Sykes' departure. Hours later, Sykes knelt in the near darkness behind a wall, watching the palatial corner house at Keaton and Kent. Warm light in a few windows offered possible locations for Alistair and flashpoints for fires. Edgar knelt by Sykes for a second before both men surged across the street and swung up and over the wall. The narrow lawn, recently trimmed, smelled lush and cool. Nothing stirred for a number of heartbeats before they moved again. Gray shadows, they moved up the wall, Sykes finding holds and setting the path, Edgar following, careful with his commitment. At an unshuttered second-story window, Edgar whispered Sykes' name. Sykes, who had climbed above it, looked down at the other. Edgar directed them in with his head. Sykes subtly shook his own head and continued up. Edgar's upper body spasmed as he cocked his jaw. Jamming his fingers between gaps in the bricks, he pushed himself after Sykes. The stones and nighttime air sapped heat from their hands, but Sykes continued up past the third level. Edgar tensed his shoulders, hauling himself up by the smallest of holds. Sykes outdistanced his peer and proceeded to the fourth floor. Edgar picked his way up while Sykes, braced with his forearm on a narrow ledge, freed a tool from his jacket, inserted it through the shutter slats, and unhooked them. Sykes' legs flexed dance-like as he replaced the tool and levered himself through the opening. A few minutes later, Edgar clawed his way in. He touched his forehead to Sykes. Why did you pass on that lower window? 
I thought you were trying to kill me. It was too easy. No guards inside or outside the wall. No dogs. Few lights, Sykes said. Let's count our good fortune and take what we can. Edgar, this place is made to break into. Too easy equals a trap, Sykes said. Why else would those shutters be left open? Edgar shrugged. Luck? Sykes cocked his chin at Edgar before saying, Something doesn't fit, especially when his assassins have acted exceptionally. Edgar let it go. So, now what? he asked. Proceed with more caution and get behind the trap. See what it's all about. Okay, Tip Top, lead on. No. You lead. I want to see if I can overhear servants talking. It might give us something to go on. You go to the stairs and see if they're guarded. Edgar hesitated, then nodded his head. The two men exited the storeroom. Sykes put his ear to the next door, and Edgar turned a corner out of sight. But as soon as he was gone, Sykes went back to the room and out the window. Falling from handhold to handhold, he reached the open second-story window and swung in. The low light cast lurid sideways shadows across the furniture, but it was still clear what the room was being used for. A vigil. Chairs circled the room, and a table held glasses and open bottles of liquor. A casket, surrounded by four large amber candles, occupied a dais at the far end of the room, which was otherwise empty of mourners and servants alike. Sykes approached the casket, but kept his eyes on the door. The odor of lime and camphor grew as he drew up to the body of Sir Alistair Ganning Gage. The torn cheek and his eyes had been sewn shut. Pigment had been applied to his burned face, but the purple-black discoloration of death showed through. His jaw was canted to one side, frozen in a protracted rictus. Sykes lifted Sir Alistair's hand and dropped it. The arm moved like a supple, living limb. Either he's been dead for less than two hours, Sykes said quietly to himself, or he died three or four days ago. Sykes looked at the door. You died that night in the alley. The door opened, and Edgar entered. There aren't any assassins, Sykes said. There aren't, Edgar asked, pouring two brandies. Why'd you kill them, Edgar? Why wouldn't I? You shouldn't say that, Edgar. Wait. Talker and Eyes. Talker and Eyes are dead too, aren't they? Yes, and that was quite the challenge you gave me. Very little time to set it up. Edgar offered a glass to Sykes, but when he wouldn't take it, he set it on the corner of the casket with a frown. You found gems, gold, silver? Edgar asked. What? No. We've got to hurry. I've already set the fires. Set the fires? There's no reason. We don't have to go anywhere. Edgar smiled. Too late. You stabbed Hunch in his left side. Had he signaled you, scratching his right ear, making it easy? Chow, you went to see him. You told him to put the signal in the window. <laughs> Turned his back right to me. And when Lever got there, Edgar nodded his head. He walked right by you to help Chow. That's why I call you Tip Top. You always figure things out. But why? Edgar sipped his drink and frowned at Sykes. It was the perfect setup, don't you see? Without believing Sir Alistair was after them, they never would have let me get that close. I was able to kill with impunity. No one cares about men like them. But to overcome their wariness, Tip Top, that is a truth worth pursuing. Sykes blinked at Edgar. You plan to kill me here. Edgar smiled. You are tip-top, tip-top. I'm certain that in a close quarters fight, surprised or otherwise, your reflexes are too fast for me. But coming in that window, seeing Sir Alistair, would put you off enough that I could get a shot in. Edgar spread his arms. Don't worry, Sykes. That's all over now. This has been a grueling test for both of us. And we've passed. Now we know we can trust each other like comrades in arms. Sykes squinted at him. I'm no murderer, Edgar. Here. Edgar stepped close, holding up the brandy. Let me show you. Look at the candle through the brandy. 
See how pure the liquor is. See how the light amplifies its amber hues. When it was first put in the cask, it was cloudy. He held the glass so that they both could look through it. We're like aged brandy, Edgar stabbed, but Sykes deflected the blow. The men spun away from each other, Sykes' dagger coming out and slashing empty air as Edgar dodged against the liquor table, upending bottles. Killing is a person's only true test, Edgar said, drawing a knife with his left hand to match the poignard in his right. They circled each other. Sykes drew a second knife and threw it as Edgar hooked his fingers. Fire scorched Sykes' arm and engulfed the liquor table. Flames jetted everywhere, but Sykes' knife appeared in Edgar's stomach. The men fell away from each other as fire dripped to the floor and climbed the wall. Pity, Tip Top, I'd very much like to kill you, to prove that I could, but the fire and your steel. Edgar disappeared into the hall. Sykes stared for a moment into the fire, but couldn't see anything there. He ran to the window and climbed out. His boots hit the ground as the house bled fire. Sykes ducked into the first alley he came to and ran for the way out as the alarm cries of men made a poor accompaniment to the roar filling the night air. Thanks for listening. Find more stories like this on my website, mattsinkovich.com. And remember, tune in next week for the next episode of The Empire's Edge. <laughs>